Hi everyone. <laughs> so welcome to the CPHR seminar series and today we've got Jane speaking who works for the Centre for Public Health Research. Um, she's been working there for about a year now um, and previously worked as a senior research executive for one of the UK's largest commercial research companies. Prior to this she spent nine years at Bangor University which is quite an achievement <laughs> um, and while she was there completed her postgraduate study gaining a master's in social research and social policy and a PhD in special educational needs and that's what the seminar is going to be about today and she's presenting findings from her recently completed PhD so congratulations thank you and I'll hand over to you thank you Deanna thanks very much welcome to everybody um, quick show of hands who is from education health and social care or anywhere outside of purely public health or health just so I know roughly how many people yeah okay that's all right just might temper what I have to say about different agencies so that's okay um, well today that's the title of my talk um, and it's a direct quote from one of my participants from my research it's like banging our heads on a brick wall um, and the reason I wanted to talk today about parents views in particular um, is in relation to the agenda on um, parental participation in the delivery of services um, across education, health, social care, etc. And there's been a long-running discussion on the extent to which parental voice and participation has been incorporated into service provision more generally. And my area of interest, obviously, is special educational needs, so I'm focusing on that area um, today and what I'm talking about. Um, so whilst what I talk about is in relation to special educational needs, I think that, that more broadly what I have to say is relevant in a wider context. So hopefully that's something that, that everybody else will be able to sort of discuss at the end maybe. So you'll have to excuse me as well because I'm not very good with gadgets. So um, if I forget, I get panicky. Um, first of all, looking at the, the policy context and, and thinking about what we mean by participation. And there's a strong uh, policy trajectory, really, that places emphasis on the participation of parents across a range of services. And I've started from um, 1978, the Warnock Report, which was a bit of a sea change in relation to educational provision and for, for children with special educational needs. The term special educational needs arose out of the Warnock Report. Um, so it rep represents, really, quite an important period of time to start looking at this policy trajectory. Before that time, there was much more of a, a medicalised approach to the way children were um, provided for in an educational context. There was a larger number of children who were um, placed in specialist setting as opposed to being incorporated into the mainstream. And so with the Warnock Report and the subsequent Education Act of 1981, integration into mainstream was high on the agenda and it raised the importance of pa parents participating in the decision-making process around that. The Education Act brought in statementing, recognised legally parents' rights in the decision-making process. So starting at that point, we're looking at how parents' views are being incorporated into decision-making. Um, I'm not going to go through in great like, detail all of these different um, policies and documents, but it just gives you a sense of the kind of course that this, this, this trajectory has gone on, really. My research was looking at how the Code of Practice for Special Educational Needs was implemented. So I was looking specifically at that document and how it was enacted in practice and what, that, uh, what, that, what the impact was on children and their parents and carers in relation to the professionals that they engaged with. So that's why that document is in there. But following on from that, there's, there's quite a range, really, of, of different policies, um, and documentation that, that applies to this, looking at Every Child Matters, looking at the Respect Action Plan, looking at Every Parent Matters, going right through to, to health related, health service, uh, National Health Service Act and Local Government Involvement in Health Act in 2008 there at the end. But there's a kind of, a, there's a bit of a dichotomy if you look at the, the, the messages that are being sent out by, by these different policy documents. And um, on the one hand, you've got a, a move towards integration, a move towards including parents in decision making, and um, a recognition of parents being partners in that process. And alongside that, you also have more of a, uh, a notion of responsibility of parents and, and how they engage with services, what the outcomes are in terms of professionalizing parenting, making sure that parents are doing what is required of them to ensure that children get the care that they need. And that then can be seen as a, as a kind of a, a barometer, if you like, to uh, evaluate 
parenting. So there's a kind of dual trajectory really and that's the first thing that I wanted to draw attention to in looking at these different documents was on the one hand parenting being seen as an inclusive um, practice that parents are engaging with different services that they're being included that they are part of the decision-making process but alongside that there is this um, responsibility agenda as well okay the final quote there's a quote at the end I just wanted to, to, to draw your attention to from the children's plan which says that services should be shaped by and responsive to children and families not designed around professional um, agendas so that most recent document there on the list really is talking about how children and families are important and they should be integral to decision making processes. Um, so what we want to look at really is, is what I saw as a fairly confused terminology really. But when you're talking about participation what do you really mean? When you're talking about parental voice what do you really mean? When it's talked about in the, con in the context of partnership is participation and partnership the same thing? Are they different things? What's actually happening? And there's a number of um, models that can be used to understand what we mean by partnership. Um, so I'm going to look at a couple of those, and I've listed them there. But I wanted to start off really by thinking about what's happened in this, this period of time that the policy that we've looked at there, how it's developed over the last sort of 13, 15 years or so, primarily under a Labour government. And the quote on the slide there from Jack Straw, I think, kind of um, it exemplifies the attitude, really, of the Labour government, where seeking advice and help, as it says, when it is needed, is seen not as a failure, but as the action of concerned and responsible parents. Again, looking at that responsibility versus rights sort of agenda. And so I wanted to look at what parents' views were in my research in relation to the help and support they were being given and the advice they were seeking and how they were engaged with services. And this is one area that, that, that's kind of emerged from what they had to say, this duality between rights and responsibilities. So looking at the models there, the various models, if you, if you, look, if you look at participation as a general concept, um, the most talked about and probably the, the best known model of participation goes back to 1969, which is Einstein's Ladder of Participation. Um, there's also a few more recent ones that I've put in there. There are others. There are other ways that people conceptualise participation, the way they present it. But these are the sort of main ones that I wanted to focus on. Um, Pew's work kind of extends the idea of the Ladder of Participation and talks about parent-teacher relationships in a continuum. Wilcox has also developed from the Ladder concept. And then White's model is slightly different um, and I've chosen those for particular reasons first of all to look in more detail Einstein's ladder of participation is what I would describe as a fairly linear concept now, given, given that this is going back to 1969 it's quite a long time ago but it is still very well used and very well referred to and as I say other people have used it and developed it since but it is a fairly linear concept um, it's it, it, it implies by virtue of the sort of steps on a ladder that you start at the bottom, you work your way up, that you start from a position of having no power, no involvement, no participation, and that the, the aim that you are seeking is at the top, that you are aiming ultimately to achieve something um, at the end of the, re of the process that you're in, which would be citizen control. And the various different levels within that ladder depend, uh, demonstrate the different levels of partition that you pop sorry, participation that you might be experiencing. Um, in relation to the involvement of children in uh, decision-making, in 1992, Roger Hart developed the, the ladder concept using the same idea that it's this kind of linear concept. Wilcox, in 94 developed it further and looked at levels of participation that were a little more developed and a little less linear, but really... The same principles, I think, apply when you look at all the different models until you come to this one from White in 2000, which is looking at forms of participation, but looking at the concept of participation in a more holistic way. Excuse me, I'll just have a sip. In terms of the relationship that exists between service users and, and service providers and the relationships and how participation is enacted, you have the first three levels starting at the top there, nominal, instrumental and representative. So if you look at um, where there's the appearance of inclusion, tokenistic in nature, there may be mechanisms in place for um, 
parents, for example, to participate, they may be invited to take part in parents' meetings at school, they may be invited to a meeting with the education authority, they may have a meeting with a clinical psychologist to discuss a diagnosis for their child. So they may be seen to be being included in that decision-making process, but how much they are able to influence the outcome determines whether or not they view that participation as nominal instrumental representative or the ideal, which is transformative, where they're empowered, their inclusion is active and on equal terms. So I think that the idea that White has presented is perhaps a better way of trying to understand the extent of participation uh, for parents and carers in this particular instance. But for me, the concern that continues, really, whichever model you look at, however you, you try to, to conceptualise it, however you try to apply those concepts and those models, the problem that continues to exist is if participation for parents in the decision-making process is seen as um, conditional, if you like, and a conditional element of effective partnership where failure to engage with services is seen as a kind of negative attribute. So parents then are, are being, um, they're being evaluated. It's a, it's, a, it's a barometer, if you like, for judging the extent and the quality of engagement of parents in that process. And referring back to what Jack Straw said, that, that kind of was where my thoughts lie with that and what my concern was. So, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> What I felt existed in terms of both the models that were being presented and the language and the, the development of policies over those past 12, 13 years or so was that there were kind of two discourses of participation. Um, where participation is being presented, where parents are um, engaged, involved, the processes are described in a very positive way. You see this positive discourse. Parental skills and experiences are valued. Um, they're included on equal terms in decision making. They're valued alongside practitioners in that process. So their views count. Um, participation can be valued in its own right. So rather than just saying we need to do this to get to there, participation is something that happens because you've got to tick the box to move on to the next thing. It's something that is embedded, if you like, in uh, the provision of services. And therefore, you get this notion of transformative participation from that positive discourse where people are actively engaged and everybody is being brought together on equal terms. And that runs concurrent to a negative discourse, which is, again, looking at the deficit model of parenting where parents are being judged, where they are maybe perceived as part of the problem. Their, their failure to engage or their engagement in a confrontational way may be seen as a problem in itself and it provides this parenting barometer uh, from which punitive measures may be applied. For example, the introduction of parenting orders uh, for parents who don't uh, compel their children to attend school, as an example. That might be relevant where you have a pupil who is dyslexic, who's self-excluding from school, and therefore um, you're going down that route. So I think they're quite relevant in that context. And in that case, with a negative discourse, you there have parental participation is very passive, it's very nominal. It's on professional terms, and that's something that, that cropped up really in the, in the interviews that I conducted with parents, is there was this sense that they were being included, they were being engaged, but it was all on professional terms. So there's a kind of persistent uncertainty really and reluctance in policy to, to really clarify the extent of partnership and to really define it definitively so that everybody understands what's involved, why they're involved, and what the expectations are within that decision-making process. So I wanted to look at some of the evidence that was out there already to think about this a little bit more. And I'm not going to go through these in great detail and read them out, each one. There's two slides here, and it's just examples, really, of existing research that's been done um, since 2002, which ties in with the introduction of the Code of Practice and this policy trajectory, where um, various different studies have looked at the concept of participation, parental involvement, parental voice, and have come up with various... Um, findings that, that, that I think um, support what I'm saying here. Um, just one or two to pick out, really. The study in particularly, <coughs> excuse me, particularly by Hodge, which was in relation to accessing mental health services, um, that's the one there at the bottom in 2005, 
there was talk of an institutional discourse in the findings from that study that made sure that participation was achieved within normative boundaries. So institutions, in services, have an idea of what they want to achieve. They use a discourse, they use a language, they use a boundary to, um, within which participation occurs that restricts the way that parents are actually able to engage with services. So it reinforces the relationships of power between uh, service users and service providers and it, it kind of ensures that parents only ever take part and achieve anything on those professional terms. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, on the second slide there, I will, these are all available by the way, these references, the slides will be available if you want them. Um, I think Hess's study, which was in 2006, was quite interesting because they found that parents had two very difficult issues to contend with when engaging with services. First of all, coming to terms with their child's condition and learning to adjust to what the needs might be in a family context and also having to adjust to what professional institutional norms and expectations were and having that kind of double whammy, if you like, of trying to please everybody in very difficult circumstances and then feeling that whichever side you're, being <coughs> you're, you're dealing with, you're being judged according to your ability to, to meet those expectations. Um, the study by Gillies in 2006 again talks about this professionalisation of child-rearing practices and, and the how parents are seeking support, what that actually means in terms of whether parents are being judged for their ability to parent or whether they're being provided the support they need to do the job in, in looking after their child, depending on what the, the, the <coughs> excuse me, their need is. And the most recent one there, LAM, uh, the LAM report uh, in 2009, which was looking at special educational needs and um, parental confidence in the service. <clears throat> and I've got a quote for you here, which basically the report said that the failure to comply with statutory obligations speaks of an underlying culture where parents and carers of children with SEN can too readily be seen as the problem and as a result parents lose confidence in schools and professionals. So parents are kind of having a bit of a hard ride really um, and it, it seems throughout this period of time there is evidence there that, that supports this fact. So... Moving on, having looked at sort of existing evidence, <coughs> I wanted to look at my own research, take my own research and, and analyse some of the, the findings from that in relation to participation. Um, it wasn't the sole focus of the research, it was, one of, it was an emerging theme that came out of, of the, the interviews that I conducted. Um, around a sort of cluster around that, that whole concept of voice which covered parents, it covered children and also um, the way that professionals were able to voice their own concerns as well. And it was, it was really quite evident um, from, from what happened that parents and professionals had very disparate views on the nature and extent of participation that was or wasn't taking place. Um, what was really evident from parents was that special educational needs is a very emotional thing for them. It was a lived experience. It wasn't something that was just a fact that was there and could be put away at the end of the day. For some parents, their children would have been diagnosed with a condition from birth, maybe. Um, it could be a physical condition that has an impact on their ability to access education, or it could be something that was later discovered after they started school. So, for example, um, a learning difficulty such as dyslexia. But whatever the nature of the condition was, for parents, it had an impact not just on them, not just on the child themselves, but on the whole family, because the ability to access services, to access support, and to meet the needs of the child, if they weren't being met, that had a huge impact on the family over a long period of time and created a great deal of tension between parents, children, other family members, and, of course, anybody that they engage with. So special educational needs was seen as a lived experience, was seen as something that was very personal to the parents that took part in the research. <coughs> Excuse me. So the data that I've used here and the findings come from interviews with 12 families. Um, and I use the word family particularly because primarily the interviews when I first set out were um, held with the parents and carers. In most cases, mothers. In some cases, fathers. Um, in a couple of cases, um, foster carers, and in one case, a grandmother. <coughs> but as I've already said, family the family unit really was, was what emerged as um, the service user because it was the whole family that was being impacted on. Um, 
Of all the families that I interviewed, only one of the families was involved with educational practitioners only. All the others were involved with a very wide range of different services from health, child and adolescent mental health services, social services, uh, charitable groups, parent partnership service, speech and language, the list goes on. Um, and the average number of practitioners that families engage with was eight outside of the normal educational sphere. So as well as liaising with school teachers, the school SENCO, which is Special edu Educational Needs Coordinator, um, and anybody within the school, the average was another eight individual practitioners that the families would engage with. So they were always in a dialogue with different range of people, wide range of people across a, a range of services. And I know this is difficult for you to see, I think, isn't it, at the back? But I wanted to sort of convey what that means for the child in the middle, the child with special educational needs. They are surrounded by this... And this is a smaller version of the original diagram, which, which kind of demonstrates really how many people they may or not be engaged with, from the criminal justice system, um, from voluntary sector, from welfare, health. I could expand it, but that's just an example, really, of how many people, the child and obviously the parents, would engage with. And from <coughs> excuse me, the families that I spoke to... Um, what really emerged was three, three things in relation to how they engage with services. One was that the family, one family might experience different levels of participation across the different services that they engage with. So they may be able to engage very effectively um, with uh, healthcare practitioners, for example, but then they may not be engaging well with educational practitioners. Or, in some cases, they may get on very well with a school teacher and anybody else who's involved educationally, but they may have a great deal of difficulties with social services. So for one family, and each of the families demonstrated this in different ways, participation was variable across services. Um, another thing that emerged was that um, participation varied according to the individuals involved. So, for example, there were some parents who could play the system, and I use that term because it's a term that the parents themselves talked about. Parents who were well-informed, who were um, fairly well educated, who may have experience of working with certain agencies in the past. For example, um, one of my participants was an ex-foster carer who had adopted a child, and so they had been known in the local area for a long time as foster carers engaging with a wide range of services in that context. So they knew everybody, and the services knew them. And they were therefore able to play the system. They knew whose doors to knock on. Conversely, there were parents who knew nothing. It was all a completely new um, area to them. They didn't understand the terminology and language being used by practitioners. They didn't know who was in charge of, of their particular circumstances for the child. And they, they didn't know who to approach. They didn't know how to deal with that. And so they felt very disengaged and felt unable to participate because they just didn't know what was going on. So that variability according to the individual characteristics of the parents was important. And then thirdly, um, specific situations or maybe the child's needs were perceived differently by the parents and those professionals they engaged with, which had an impact on participation. For example, um, a child diagnosed with dyslexia. Um, I can tell you about Mark, for example, and it's a pseudonym. Um, a little boy of uh, six years old in mainstream primary school diagnosed with dyslexia, um, and he had autistic traits as well. His parents were concerned that he wasn't accessing education effectively. He was very high functioning, um, so he was bored at school because he was not being given enough work to sustain, to, to interest him in the classroom. But because of his autistic traits, because of his difficulties, he had very poor social skills. So whilst he was achieving academically at school, on one level, he was also not achieving because he wasn't mixing with other children. He had particular needs, for example, he wasn't um, out of nappies, so he had, um, his parents had to visit the school and deal with toileting issues. And they were concerned that these were impacting on his ability to uh, access education and to keep him um, interested. He was showing signs of not wanting to go to school because he was bored, because he didn't get on with anybody. The teachers, he felt he didn't get on with them. And so the parents had one perspective, that where they felt that they weren't getting his needs met. The teachers were actually arguing counter to that by saying, well, no, he's doing well in the classroom. He's achieving all the levels that we want him to. He doesn't need support. It wasn't the academic support that he needed. It was support with social skills. But there was this tension between the 
parents and the educational practitioners around whether he needed support or not. Obviously, participation there is being viewed very differently from those parents because they felt they weren't getting the support they needed. Um, so really what that, I think, what I wanted to sort of demonstrate was, was that participation there is seen differently by different people. It, it creates a lot of different dilemmas for everybody engaged in, in that process. Um, that it can be perceived as problematic in one sense, as, f as, as, as um, effective in another, um, and it's very much context dependent and it seems to be very dependent on the individuals involved in, in each case. Um, how are we doing for time? We're good. Oh, right, we're good. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. So, <clears throat> okay. Um, what I did then, after thinking about some of these thoughts and, and, and trying to understand what was going on for some of these families, um, I wanted to, to sort of explore how this was manifesting for the parents and the practitioners as well where they're being brought together to make decisions. Um, for example, another one here, um, child Bobby with um, very complex physical and intellectual impairments, was, was born with a genetic disorder and his early years, his early years in his life were, um, he, was, he was actually diagnosed not to survive beyond the age of three. Um, he had a lot of very specialised medical care in his early years and his mother became a medical carer for him in the home. He had a lot of medical equipment in the home that so she was caring for him. He survived, he progressed, he developed and he ended up at the age of 14 actually being put into mainstream secondary school because certain modifications were made and the support was provided to him. But his mother described the battle that she had across those years trying to win his place in mainstream school and her, her justification for him being there. Uh, the difficulty that she had in relating to social services, particularly in terms of getting modifications for him in the home and then the education authority getting modifications in school, but that she had very good relationship with the healthcare workers. So health was good, education and social services were bad. And she described some of the um, instances where uh, they had joined together to make decisions on behalf of Bobby. And it started sort of creating what I saw as a kind of like a, a, a binarism really where you've got parents views saying one thing and the professional views were almost diametrically opposed to what the parents were saying. So in terms of um, engaging with a service to, to, to provide support, Bobby's mother for example said I have a right to speak, I have a right to do this, you know I, I have a right to seek support for my son to enable him to, to live in an appropriate way to be able to do the things I want him to do. Um, the opposite to that was the professionals, whether they felt they had a responsibility to act or not. And if they felt um, that they were exceeding what they f saw as a professional imperative. So parents, professionals felt that parents had a choice as to whether or not they could engage, as to whether or not they could seek out support. But for professionals, they had to do what they were expected to do within their professional role. So choice versus this professional imperative, the right to speak versus a responsibility to act. And that cropped up time and time again, particularly where parents were engaging with a wide range of services, not just in education, but involving health and social services as well. <coughs> I think the most troubling um, uh, comment that came really from... Um, both parents and professionals that, that, that were interviewed, was this idea that, th the idea that where parents thought they were collaborating and working with professionals, it was seen as confrontational by the part of, of not all, but some practitioners in certain fields. And it did seem that um, the practitioners in education seemed to be the, the most troublesome area. Um, I should add, I suppose, that this is research conducted in one specific area, so it, I don't want to generalise it, but this is what came out of the interviews that I conducted. So where parents were seeking out help, seeking support, approaching teachers, approaching educational um, officers at the LEA, they were doing what they thought was right, they were asking for help. The, the, prof the professionals in turn were, were perceiving that as confrontation. Um, the sheet that I've given you here, this handout, to sort of provide a little bit of a real voice of, of, of the of the participants. There's some quotes on there. Can I borrow yours, Deanna, a minute? Just point out one in particular. 
this idea of collaboration and confrontation. I think some of the parents' quotes, the ones particularly on the left-hand side there, which are these ones here, kind of illustrate um, this idea that parents think they're seeking help, that parents think they're doing the right thing. They believe they have a right to, to approach practitioners and then they're seen confrontationally the practitioners run away, they close the door, they don't answer the phone, it's that woman on the phone, it's, it's this negative kind of response. And then the, the final point really there in terms of expecting support or seeking support was that parents quite often were under an assumption that if they asked for help they would get it. There was this general belief that, well, that's what, this, that's, what's, that's what it's there for. I can go to my parent partnership service and they'll help me. I can go to the LEA and ask to get one-to-one uh, -one support in the classroom. I can ask to have modifications made in the school because it's what Bobby needs, it's what Mark needs, it's what Louise needs. And they felt that the process of asking for that help automatically inferred their right to, to receive that help. And, but for professionals saw that differently because they felt that a lot of the time parents had unrealistic expectations about what was actually doable, about what funds and resources would allow, about the fact that in certain contexts um, provision of support was conditional on certain things. For example, a child with dyslexia, if they're diagnosed with dyslexia, if they are not severe enough then they go to the bottom of the pile. You have to be, um, I, case in point, um, Louise who is dyslexic, another of, of, of the children in the families that I spoke to, had been di diagnosed with dyslexia, but her, her condition wasn't severe enough for her to merit receiving support in the classroom over and above what the school could ordinarily offer, so she, could, she didn't qualify to have um, a one-to-one -one support in the classroom. And her parents didn't understand why that wasn't possible. Um, and so their assumption of support was met with professionals basically saying, well, no, look, we have this, this is the resource pot. We can only do so much with it. Therefore, we have to prioritise. We have to look at what's available, look at what the greatest need is. <clears throat> and so a kind of deservability factor comes in in some cases, particularly you start looking at social, emotional and behavioural difficulties, which is the most problematic area in special educational needs in terms of children <coughs> uh, receiving the support that they need. So really what, what I found was this, this tension between parents' views and professional views around what was possible, what was doable, what was acceptable, what they felt partic participation meant for them and their child in relation to what professionals um, were able to provide and, and felt was reasonable. And I think some of that goes back to the findings from the existing research, which basically looked at the kind of the institutional boundaries, looking at the, the limitations in an institutional setting in terms of what you can and can't do, looking at um, this per persistent failure to meet need that parents sometimes are seen as part of the problem, where they think they're collaborating and professionals think they are being confrontational. That creates a problem in itself that, that then reduces the effect, if you like, of that participation. So, um, what I really felt about that was that it, it, it means that models of participation that are in existence at the moment are not adequate. They don't really provide a meaningful way of describing how participation can be brought about. The language is there, the rhetoric is there, the policies all describe ways that parents could or should be included in decision-making processes. But in terms of actually enacting that on the ground, in terms of how that happens for practitioners, I don't think it addresses um, either how it should happen or how it actually does happen. The problems are where multiple agencies are involved. As, we've, as I've already said, um, participation may be good when engaging with one service, but, but not with another. Um, and with multi-agency practice, where many different practitioners are brought together with the child at the centre, it's important that that participation is seen to be effective in all of those spheres. Participation may cause conflict between one agency and another where medical support is provided that has an impact in an educational sense, but the educational practitioners then are saying, well, hang on a minute, we can't actually accommodate this. We don't have the staffing, we don't have the space, we don't have the resourcing. And also, in terms of, again, looking at the impact on the wider family, 
SEN provision is focused on the needs of the child um, who has that need, but the extent to which that need is met does impact on the whole family, and um, I think a family approach to service provision is what's required, really, to, to, to make sure that, that these tensions are reduced, hopefully. Um, and really just trying to look at the difference between whether it's parents that we want to focus on in terms of their engagement or whether the family as a, as a unit is more important. Um, that's as far as I've got with it because it's something I want to develop further because, as I say, at the beginning of the process with the PhD, participation in itself wasn't something that I was um, focusing on, but it emerged from the findings. And I want to look at the development of this idea of participation across different services and how to maybe remodel it or, or address that through looking at new models. <coughs> so... Um, that's where you come in, really, and any feedback you've got on any of that would be really good. So these are some of the references that I've um, uh, put into the presentation, and the slides will be available as well <coughs> at the end. Thank you so very much. It. That was very insightful. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure everyone will, will agree. It's very insightful and very interesting. <coughs> and having worked with Jane for, for the last year, not really heard that much about the PhD. <laughs> it's been kind of, we knew it was there and that it was, it was taking place, but we <laughs> didn't, didn't really get a chance to talk about it very much. So it's really good to hear what you've been um, doing. So has anybody got any questions that they would like to ask? I am going to ask you to speak into the microphone for the purposes of the video. <coughs> well, I'd be interested to hear what Andy has to say, because he's done some <laughs> stuff on um, engaging with children with special educational needs in an educational context. I'm not... I'm sorry, Andy, but I know you quite often like to have things to say. Um, and maybe David as well might want to comment. It, it was interesting. I thought um, a lot of what you said, I think, maps on to the rather limited research which has been published in the world of fiddle education certainly which tends to be largely ex ignored actually in inclusive education more generally and mm. the findings which um, have been reported in this kind of area particularly focus on the engagement of parents in um, the identification of, of children who may have a special educational needs in one subject, let's say English, math or science, mm. but not one in physical education and vice versa. Mm. Uh, and of course in physical education, like sport generally, it's quite resource demanding. Mm. Um, and parents are not often consulted in many cases in decisions over whether a child should in mainstream schools be included within the same lesson as other children mm. or not. And one of the key decisions which are often which often structures that um, decision amongst parents and schools is whether the schools can actually afford to have that child in the room in the first place. Mm. So w one thing w which struck me was, did any of, were any of your parents involved in negotiations over resources no. for children in, in school? No, they weren't. Um, they were, they, well, they were involved in the sense that um, they were aware that the child needed certain... Um, forms of support and so where <coughs> different practitioners were brought together to discuss the nature of that support for example through the statementing process particularly um, if a child was referred for statementing then obviously different evidence would be brought together but it was parents certainly felt that it was very tokenistic and that they were in the room they were there with different people but they didn't really have an opportunity to actively um, to really influence what was being done. that They could comment on it, they could be present to see what was going on, but they couldn't really influence it. Um, and in terms of actual resourcing, for example, through moderating panels where the LEA um, sit and basically made a decision about how they divide the pot up, um, no, uh, there was no lay involvement in the moderating panel that I saw. I, I attended some of the moderating panel meetings as part of the kind of observations that I did, and there were no lay members present. Were there examples of kind of what's often refer to as reverse inclusion or reverse integration where because of the poor experiences that the families had within schools or parents had within schools that they decided to take the child out of mainstream and not the parents that I spoke to none of the families I spoke to felt that although there was one one family one girl who had been in a specialist setting um, and then transferred into mainstream secondary school was having extreme problems 
um, because she wasn't being given support despite having a statement that allowed her to have one-to-one uh, -one support in the classroom. Um, but the, even then, the family didn't say, we want her back in specialist setting. What parents' views seemed to be was that it was important for children to be included in mainstream because it wasn't just about how many GCSEs you could get. It wasn't just about purely education. It was about developmental stages and about integrating with members of your community and about developing into adult life and what that would mean for those children. Bobby was a case in point. <coughs> the, the, the young lad with really complex, severe needs. He was in a wheelchair, um, very limited speech, so he, had, um, he used sign language intellectual impairments but he was in mainstream and his mother fought really hard to get him into mainstream because she wanted him to grow up and to be in school with his peers so that when he became an adult he would be and you know as he integrated into society more it wouldn't be a, a shock to him that's what she said she wanted him to be seen as part of the community and that was as important for the peers around him to recognize him as a member of the community as it was for him to recognize himself and so parents kind of felt that they were almost doing two jobs in a way. Their child was in mainstream, assisted the child in, in locating themselves in, in a community, but also opened up the eyes of everybody around them to what their needs were, which they felt was important. So, I mean, it's a small sample, obviously. It was 12 families, but all of those people, all of those families felt that mainstream was the place that their child should be. The f final thing for me, I think you hinted at it at the beginning when you were talking about the foreign language, that particular kinds of families or parents were able to affect greater change in their child's lives by <coughs> privileging particular <coughs> interests and so on. And I, mm. I wondered whether those particular kinds of parents were better able to do that because of the various resources which they had at their disposal and whether social capital in some cases was quite important to explain mm. the differential participation of some families in yeah. this process rather than... Yeah, I think that's very true, and it was certainly the case of uh, only a couple of families, but the one in particular um, who were the ex-foster carers who were what you would term a middle-class, educated family, well-informed, actively seeking information to support their case, who knew who to go to, who, who, like I said, they could play the system, and they admitted it themselves, they could play the system. Um, and one of the other families, um, uh, an ex-teacher, who, again, knew the system, so knew who to go to. And I think, yes, there is a sense that um, parents who have that ability, who are confident, who are knowledgeable, who have those means to, available to them, are able to um, enforce their, enforce, I say enforce their will, but to enforce their point of view more effectively so they do, they do get heard better. Whether they um, ultimately are able to affect real change, it does ultimately come down to resources in a lot of cases, but they are certainly more effectively heard in those kind of scenarios. That's, yeah. that's, I'm going to shut up in a minute. <laughs> yes. I feel like an after dinner speaker. But, um, <laughs> it, it did seem that participation, from what I, you were saying, was actually understood by some families as consultation, not necessarily as a desirable outcome of that consultation. So some, for some people, bit participating was just simply being heard and being consulted for their mm. views, mm. not necessarily having those views translated into meaningful practice whether it relates to mainstream or, or not. Some was parents it? don't want to be actively engaged and this was an interesting thing that came from some of the teachers that I spoke to was their complaints were kind of almost the opposite it was like well it's some parents just never turn up to meetings some parents don't want to be involved some parents want to be able to say off you go there's little Johnny he goes through the gate deal with it um, <laughs> and it, there's always that dilemma, isn't there? You know, it's the parents you don't get to speak to are the ones that you really need to speak to, and that's the same when you're conducting research as when you're a teacher, whatever you're doing. It's, it would be great to have the voices of those parents as well and say, well, why are you not engaging? Is it because you don't know who to speak to, you don't want to? What is that about? And as I say, it's only 12 families that I've spoken to. Um, so, yes, I mean, there are different levels of participation that parents may want to engage at. They may not want to go all the way, as it were. Um, but I suppose my concern is that for, for the parents that do want to engage at a higher level, the parents that do feel that they are being um, prevented, if you like, um, you know, those mechanisms do seem to be quite restricting. And, 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 and again, it's looking at that relationship between different services that you can participate well in one area but not in another. And ultimately, these people are all coming together 
around that child, but that that, that participation is so variable. Sorry, does that does that answer? You? <laughs> no, it, it's quite there's a the tension thread. between, on the one hand, this view of responsible parenting. Mm. <clears throat> and some parents feeling inclined to be involved and, and others who prefer to take more of a hands-off approach. And then the, the realm of education where parents to some extent, or the function of education where parents are to some extent expected to make some contribution or what the role of educationalists yeah. is in the first place. Yeah. And there isn't a very clear middle ground mm. which m makes this even more complex, I suppose, mm. right? how you separate those out. Yeah, yeah. Anyone Thank else you. Got a uh, yeah, thanks very much, Jean. Um, question really was related around perhaps a more general point, but you've mentioned quite a bit about ideological values of parents and feeling that they thought it was good for the child to be in the mainstream setting mm. and mixing with other mainstream pupils, mm. which seems to underpin a large degree of the policy around disability and SEN and inclusion anyway, that it's based on that premise. Mm. But I was just wondering if related partly to a point that Andy asked, if any parents mentioned any unintended outcomes of the pupils being involved in that setting and whether there was any uh, discrimination or stigmatising aspects associated with that inclusion? For the child themselves. For the child themselves. Yeah. Did they recall any examples? Or? Um, yes. Bobby is the first one where it was seen as a very positive step and that all of his friends, his peers, he had a very good network of friends who were all friends he'd made in mainstream school, that he was seen to be a character in the local town. Everybody knew him. He was out in his wheelchair. Um, if anybody ever had a go at him, his friends would step in and, and support him. Um, so that was a very positive example where it was a good experience for the child being in mainstream. Um, there was one in particular, the, the example um, of the girl who had been moved from a speci specialist setting into mainstream, um, and she'd actually already moved schools once in the mainstream because of bullying issues. Um, and the bullying, it wasn't really clear from what, from, from what the parents were saying whether the bullying was related to her special educational needs status or whether there was other issues and it's not something that I really explored in any great detail because it was the one it was the one interview that I actually debated whether or not I should continue with it because the, the, the pressures that the family were under as a result of what was happening for this particular girl were so great that there was tensions between the parents um, between the mother and father it was impacting on the other younger daughter um, and the family really were under a great deal of stress and I kind of, I was in that position where I was thinking, I'm not sure I should be having this interview. I'm not sure what I'm doing here, whether this is helping or not. But um, the mother actually wanted to continue because she felt it was her only way of, of expressing her concerns and maybe getting some help. Um, slightly sort of going off point a little bit, but most of the parents I spoke to took part in the research because they felt it was another way of them finding a voice that they couldn't find in any other kind of setting. That even though they'd... Um, gone to the parent partnership service for support they didn't feel that they were getting anywhere and it's like maybe if I just splurt it all out to you something will come of it or I you know other people will hear what's happening and it might help other people um, so yeah and not to go back to your question not in, not in every case it was a positive experience but it wasn't clear whether that was directly related to their SEN status or the lack of support they were getting it that that wasn't really I couldn't determine that um, yeah, I was just looking at one of the quotes on your handout, Jane, mm. about um, parents suggest, or it's a, um, a Senko suggesting that um, when a medical practitioner gets involved that the parents tended to mm. prioritise or go with, with their point of view. Yeah. I just wondered what the parents said about, um, about how they, they made a judgement about whose advice they should be using, that sort of thing. Mm. You know, was it people that they had rapport with or... Was it because they thought their medical opinion was more valuable? Yeah, that's quite an interesting question, actually, because I think it's quite variable. And I think taken, if you take a kind of broad brush look at what parents' views generally might be, I think they would always defer to medical opinion over and above anybody else. But then in specific instances where they had experienced engaging with different practitioners, it would be more based on specific relationships. So, for example, if they had a very good relationship with a teacher, 
they would trust the teacher's judgment over what a doctor might say. Um, <clears throat> I think that quote, uh, I'm trying to see which one. Th this one, this, this is quite interesting, this big fat one in the middle here, this quote, the mother of the four-year-old with ADHD, that was, that's the lady who was a foster carer who adopted the four-year-old and had a lot of experience of dealing um, with a wide range of practitioners. In the process of getting um, diagnoses for this little lad, he's, he'd been displaying inappropriate behaviour in the classroom at school um, and the school teacher was concerned about it, the mother was concerned about it, the father was concerned obviously. Um, wanted to address it so a paediatrician was called in and in the meeting with a paediatrician in her office sort of however long it was a 30 minute assessment or whatever he behaved impeccably and the paediatrician said to the mother well look there you go there's nothing wrong with him he's just a normal healthy little four year old boy and the mother said he is here in this setting but when he's in the classroom with children of his own age he's behaving inappropriately with children of his own age that's the problem. The teachers highlighted the problem, and I'm highlighting the problem. And the only reason that any credence was given to what she was saying was because she was a foster carer with many years' experience who the paediatrician had known previously from other encounters. And she actually said to the mother, because it's you, I will make a referral. We will deal with this. Otherwise, it would have been just brushed aside. So, it, it's, it, again, it's not straightforward. It, it, it's quite complex, and it is dependent, I think, on a, a development of personal relationships in some of those instances. But, as I say, broadly, parents, I think, defer to medical opinion over any other. We've probably got time for one more question. Anybody got a question? Got a comment here. More than a question. I think um, it's just um, kind of good to remind ourselves that when we're dealing with professionals, we're actually dealing with, dealing with people, and some of the main things, main points that you've drawn out is that um, relationships or advice were built on relationships with people they'd had a personal rapport with and mm. every professional that you come across is actually an individual with their own personality and their own mm. understanding of the world and mm. that's what parents are coming up against not professionals they're mm. coming up against people mm. <laughs> I started to finish um, <laughs> <laughs> the one thing that did strike me Jane is that you you implied that many of the models of participation that currently exist are both static and unidimensional representations mm. of decision making and policy making, particularly in relation to parents. And your data seem to indicate that it's more complex than that, mm. both in terms of the number of parties involved, but also in terms of the levels at which decisions are made, mm. then the outcomes, more importantly, that those decisions generate. So. $64,000 question, how are you going to explain that? <laughs> is this something that you're that's going to look to do in the future? Is that what you're looking at? That is phase two, that's what I want to look at. I, I do want to look at this in more detail, because as I say, I didn't go into the research for the purpose of examining participation specifically. Uh, it's something that's kind of emerged and is still emerging, really. Um, and so I do want to explore that in more depth and try and find a way of, of, of if it's possible. It may not be possible to do it. I don't know. Maybe that is the inherent tension in the system, is that you can't model these things, that maybe you just have to accept that there are these differences or, you know, um, I would like to think maybe not, but it, it's, I would like to, to look at it in more detail and try and find a, a, a different way of, of modelling it, if possible, that, that, that addresses those, those issues, really. Yeah, so... Thank you very much once again and thank you everybody for thank coming. You. Just a quick reminder that our next seminar is actually next week, um, so a week today and we have got Robin Mann from Bangor University coming to give us a talk about grandparenting and the impact of caring on older family members. And I can't remember whether it's here or downstairs but um, hopefully we'll see some oh of I you there. Either, actually, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. But yeah, thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you.